Today's session is Realising a Vision for the Digital Shift, RLUK's Digital Shift Manifesto two years on. And I am absolutely privileged to have the opportunity to share this session as well as our current RLUK Digital Shift Working Group. And I just wanted to say a few words before we move on to um, our speakers. Um, it was in May 2020 when RLUK launched its Digital Shift Manifesto, and it provided an ambitious vision for the research library community for us regarding the ongoing digital shift in our collections, spaces, stakeholder relations and skills. And while it was envisaged before the advent of COVID-19, the launch and the implementation of the manifesto did coincide with the pandemic. And as a result of that, we've learned an awful lot during that time, both individually, institutionally and collectively uh, across research libraries, UK and beyond. In today's symposium, some of the current members of the RLUK Digital Shift Working Group will reflect on the ambitions of that manifesto and the future challenges and opportunities facing the community around the digital shift. How can we continue to build on the manifesto's vision and its success over the last two years and also seize our collective learning from the COVID-19 pandemic? We include some contributions from colleagues who had originally contributed, indeed led on the manifesto's creation and colleagues who have used the manifesto in their work and are actually out with the, the working group. So as we reflect back, it was on Monday the 18th of May when RLUK launched the manifesto for the digital shift in research libraries. The webinar was attended by over 450 delegates from across the world. It was a product of more than a year's work by members of the, the digital shift working group and the vision that it created was for the research library of the future, but critically an overview of how this vision might be shaped and the tangible steps and work plans, which we'll touch on at the, the end of today's session to enable its realization. And I had the opportunity since I was chairing this session to, to revisit the recording for the manifesto launch. And I was struck in particular by Masood, Kokar's digital, uh, Masood was our digital shift champion and the director, uh, and now the director of Leeds University Library. And Masood had made some closing comments that this was the beginning of a long journey, but also that it was a journey which was when we needed to think holistically around across print collections, users, space, and staff. All of the multiple touch points that we experience professionally, and I think personally in our lives around kind of digital. And these are all underpinned by the vision and the work plan of the Digital Shift Manifesto. So today's session is really an opportunity to update on that launch, on that journey, and on that ambition as we look back to the heady days of 2020, to reflect and to celebrate some of the impact and to engage you, our wider community, who sit at the heart of all of the work which RLUK does and which the manifesto seeks to inform. It's been really fantastic to have the opportunity over the last couple of years to hear from individuals and from institutions who have used the manifesto and its framework to help to inform and shape some of their discussions internally around their own strategies and their own ways of realizing some of the, their, their digital shift uh, activities. And it's a privilege to be the chair of the Digital Shift Working Group. Its membership has grown and evolved over the last couple of years. Many original members have moved on to new roles. Many of them are now directors and new directors uh, and new members have joined us readily sharing their dynamism, their experience, and their expertise with us. And we'll hear some of that today, which I'm looking forward to. Mm -hmm. So here is today's program. So we've got the introduction and welcome. And then following that, we'll have the early years of the Digital Shift Manifesto uh, from Torsten Reimer from the University of Chicago. We will then have a session on the shift to digital where Colleagues Josh Shendal and Claire Knowles will share some of their experiences 
from their institutions and sort of at that digital coalface. We'll take a break for a few minutes and then we'll return for the shift within digital, picking up around that move towards digital maturity with Ian Gifford from the University of Manchester and Susan Halfpenny from University of Aberdeen. And then we will move into a discussion and next steps session. I'm going to provide an update just on some of the broad brush work plans and some of the activities which uh, the Digital Shift Working Group are doing in the medium term as we move, as we move forward. And we'll be actively encouraging some questions and answers. We have some provocations for uh, colleagues on the call as well. And please, I would encourage you to continue to dynamically use the chat uh, and use the, the Q&A so that we can collectively work together to celebrate and reflect on the Digital Shift Forum. But without further ado, I am delighted to hand over to Torsten Reimer. Torsten was the chair of the Digital Shift Working Group and indeed a real leading light in the realisation and creation of the manifesto. Torsten is now the Dean of Libraries at the University of Chicago, so we very much appreciate the fact that he is joining us uh, from, uh, from his morning uh, in the Windy City, and I'm going to pass over to Torsten. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let me just quickly share my screen. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, William, uh, for the introduction. It's really great to be here. Having been involved in, in the early stages and being a historian by training, I also found that the, uh, the suggested title, The Early Years, is quite fitting. But when I was reflecting on what I was going to say, um, there was something that was slightly bugging me about the title. And I finally realized yesterday evening what that was. Um, and it's this, not Pink Floyd, and I should at this point apologize uh, to any Pink Floyd fans in the audience. But the early years I realize is a term that I think is quite often used when someone in the marketing department Things like, oh, we have this artist that we had for a really long time, and can we make a bit more money and maybe let's make an early years compilation. And I had this in the back of my mind yesterday evening and this morning when I walked to work, and I was thinking, does this in any way apply to the work of the Digital Shift Working Group? And I'm pretty confident that I can say, no, it doesn't. But I thought it might be useful to reflect a little bit about sort of the early stages of the work and maybe how I envisaged this would go and how it's gone since. One of the things that sort of strikes me about giving presentations in this context is that um, pretty much I think throughout my career, whenever we talked about interesting digital technology and how we can deploy it, I think easy sharing, reliable easy sharing of presentations on screens is something that we still haven't cracked and maybe might want to add onto a digital shift agenda. Yeah, anyway, so I was thinking about um, how we started the work for Digital Shift. And it was uh, a working group, that's what it's still called, but I would argue it's actually become something bigger. I mean, originally we were tasked with developing uh, this manifesto, um, which we did. And I was really pleased to see this because I think for those of you who have been involved in, in working group, it's relatively easy to pull one together. It's uh, a bigger challenge to keep everyone focused and engaged in particular through very uh, busy periods. But I think what we've seen already while we were working on this, there was a really, really strong resonance from across the community. And there was interest not just in the UK, but way, be, way beyond. And we've seen this uh, in the sort of continued activity. And I would argue that the working group really has sort of shifted and become a steering group that's pulling together activities from across the different networks in our UK, uh, and also coordinating activities of other library associations and, and communities. And just, I think, looking back over the last two years, I think something quite impressive has been achieved in terms of the number of events and activities that have been run. I'm going to say a little bit more about this uh, later. But it seems to me, <clears throat> and in particular now, looking at this uh, a bit more from the outside, is that um, the work of this group and 
the whole networks and the RUK community um, that's been supporting it feels really strongly embedded in the work of RUK. I think this is partly a sign of, of the ongoing importance and also of some of the lessons that we've learned about the importance of digital and the digital shift during the pandemic that um, gives me a lot of confidence that uh, what we are really talking about is the early years. And that in many ways, I think the work of the group was really just about laying the groundwork, building onto this theme that um, Masood mentioned when we launched the initiative about this really being a long-term initiative. And I sort of want to approach it in the next few minutes very much from a perspective on laying the groundwork for things that are going to come over the next few years. I don't intend to speak in much detail about what's in the manifesto. I think you can, you can all look that up. It's on the website. But pick up a few themes. But before I do that, uh, I obviously have to acknowledge members of the Digital Shift Working Group. We're not going to read all the names. And as William said, I think quite a few of the job titles of people who were in the group at the time have changed. Some of us have even left country or in two cases, even uh, changed continent since, and new members have come onto the group. But I think this uh, sort of captures the membership of the group around the time when we launched the Digital Shift Manifesto. And I should say that everyone was on this group because of some expertise that they brought personally, but also crucially uh, because of their engagement in our UK networks. And the RUK networks played a crucial role in pulling this all together. So at the same time, as I think I want to acknowledge individual colleagues who put a lot of time and effort into this, it's really been a true community initiative across our UK, across all the network, networks. And I think it's been made better and stronger for it. Now, why did we do this? If I wasn't too cliches, I would probably show a slide like this one about some attempt at visualizing artificial intelligence. And in many ways, I feel it's perhaps not necessary to say why you would want to have a digital shift manifesto, uh, considering the ongoing importance of digital, not just, I think, in libraries, but crucially, the transformation that we've seen in the last few years across society, that we've seen in teaching, and that we've seen in research. I mean, this is obviously an important point. We are not in this just for ourselves as libraries. We are there to support the communities that we work with, both in and outside of our universities and outside of our research organizations. And they've all been affected and will increasingly be affected by digital. So that in itself, I think, is a good enough reason to have a digital shift working group. But I'm presenting this, I think, with a reflection that um, one shouldn't approach this naively. I think sometimes digital is presented as this sort of radically new, all transforming, all changing things that will transcend the, the physical and transform many businesses and operations into almost completely digital ones. And that may be true in some cases, but I think it's much more nuanced when we look at the library world. And in fact, you could say that digital has been around in libraries for much longer than I have. I mean, some of you who've been around in the 80s may recognize this or sort of similar screens from library systems from the 80s. So depending on, I think, where you would draw the line, you can comfortably say that digital has been in research libraries in the 80s. In some cases, it has been well before. And so when we're talking about a digital shift, I don't think we should, and I think thankfully, I hope we haven't conceptualized this as something that in itself is radically new. But what I think we have seen over time in a digital environment is a shift where something that maybe initially was in isolated areas, then grew, grew across wider parts of uh, library operations, is now really permeating everything that we do in libraries, even some parts of our work that have no direct digital impact are in some ways driven and informed by information and by digital elements that sit outside of it. So we're not thinking about digital as something that's new, but we're recognizing that there is not just a shift towards digital, there are shifts within digital, and it's an ongoing activity where we constantly have to update our skills, we have to realize what's happening in libraries, what's happening outside of libraries, do we speak the right language and do we have the right interfaces of engaging with our users and patrons and do we have the right infrastructure sort of behind our services to uh, power and inform not just 
what we do, but also the thinking that goes into developing the services. So crucially, I think we thought about this as an ongoing evolving shift. And I mentioned the ongoing and evolving part in this because we didn't put out a plan and said, that's it, that's what we're going to do in two or three years and then everything is done. We realized that we would have to have an activity that can be flexible enough to react. We didn't necessarily foresee that there would be a global pandemic, but we did know that there would be other shifts and changes that would happen. And we also felt that what we are looking at is not just a shift away from physical to digital, that is way too simple, in particular for libraries. There are some businesses who maybe realize opportunities in the digital space, and then they made the, in some cases, bold, but in other cases, also relatively easy decision and say, let's take our resources and move them from the physical and analog into the digital world. And we can't do this as libraries, at least not completely, um, because partly we are guardians of knowledge, and a lot of this knowledge still exists in print form, but also the service expectations, quite rightly, that our users have of us, they involve access to print, they involve access to spaces, they involve physical in-person engagement uh, advice working amongst users, but also uh, working with library staff. These are all critical elements. So we never thought and we never championed an approach of a digital shift that said this is going to replace the physical, the analog, the book. Um, but rather thinking about complementing it. And that arguably is a lot harder because libraries have this challenge that we need to keep core physical operations going. We need to develop, evolve, improve our digital operations. That's already a big enough challenge, but then crucially, we need to bring both of them together. And that's an intellectual challenge. It's also a researching challenge. And like all the other elements that I've mentioned, it is also a not insignificant skills challenge. So these were all challenges that we felt we'd be facing uh, in scoping this work. And we can see this in some of the feedback that we had from the community. I'm not going to, to read through all of those, but as part of our engagement, I think a whole host of issues uh, were raised, including, for example, how to have sustainable investment in digital in a very constrained financial environment. And this goes back to the point that I've raised about supporting physical uh, and digital. Thinking about how to approach these challenges strategically and having reliable foresight that informs you, if you have scarce resources, where you want to put them, how you set up a culture that really makes it maybe not seamless, but at least not an insurmountable challenge to continually improve your services and have a culture of sort of innovation that is also sort of open and transparent and makes it easy for staff to engage. And crucially, I think, in my mind, probably the biggest challenge in a way is the whole matter of skills in digital innovation. That is crucial in particular in an environment where we often can't pay the salaries that we need to uh, bring experts into a library. In some areas we can, but I think we often have to think about how we can train our staff uh, and help them gain new skills. And this is, to me, I think really one of the critical challenges, having a culture of innovation and working across our organizations and with partners to make sure that we're moving in the right direction and that we have the skills and tools ready and that we are seen as, as trusted partners so that we can master some of these uh, emerging technologies and some of the technologies that are really not emerging, but still, I think, not fully embedded in our operations. So how did we identify these community needs? I think we ran a serial of virtual group meetings that were influenced by all the expertise that we had around our virtual table, but we also engaged with the RUK community through the networks and brought information in. Uh, we ran a workshop and a range of sessions, and based on this then put together um, a draft and the idea then was that in March 2020, we would run sessions at the RUK conference that we then had to cancel due to COVID. And that then led to the manifesto being launched based on that engagement at the virtual event in March 2020. So that was the initial work of the group. Um, but it's, I think, since evolved into something a lot wider. And it's built around broadly four themes. I mean, like any attempt to reduce something as complex as this into a diagram, inevitably, I think it's a bit overly simplistic. 
But the key themes that we had were skills, scholarship, spaces, and stakeholders. And scholarship, in that sense, I think is largely about how we serve our user communities through collections, through engaging in research and teaching. Spaces, obviously, is providing the environments, digital, hybrid, and physical, in which that can happen. Stakeholders and advocacy is about the ongoing development of relationships with our partners, but also advocating for the resources that libraries need. And then skills is the point that I mentioned before, the part that powers everything. And skills cut across the library and also means that we felt it was crucial in this work to think about how we can help leaders in the library sector to evolve their knowledge, their thinking, because ultimately any kind of complex sort of cultural change and transformation needs that well-informed leadership. And therefore, we felt it was sort of critical to think about this not purely in a technical, but really largely in a social and enabling context. We put together a program and just at the very high level brought it down into um, three phases. Uh, an initial short term um, thought about maybe roughly about two years. It's sort of broadening our understanding, reaching out beyond our core communities to just assess sort of where we are, what are key challenges, uh, what kind of gaps do we currently have, and then create a forum for discussion that can help sort of inform future activities. And that's the work that's largely been completed. Then I think the second phase is one of ongoing engagement. And then based on what we've learned, um, move forward addressing, for example, skills gap uh, and moving forward with other activities to support the community. And then the third one, we've partly deliberately kept a bit vague uh, because it's difficult to forecast that much ahead, but also we realized there would be changes and obviously COVID has been, has been one of them. Now, speaking of COVID, this I think in many ways was a test of the digital shift. It was a test of the whole way of how we worked as a group because everyone became significantly more busy, but there was also significantly more demand. And our UK has been able to, I think, support libraries through a range of activities. There's also been a report, a report on uh, COVID-19. And then this article that I've screenshotted here that came out of the work of the working group. And there were a whole host of things that we've learned. And I think I'm not going to uh, go into any detail, but one of the crucial ones I think that many universities realized is the importance of library spaces at the heart of the university and the massive hole that opens up when those spaces have to be closed. And the challenges of then moving operations online in an environment where the systems are maybe not quite as scalable, but also I think the huge benefit um, that libraries have been enabled, in particular, I think to deliver through the lockdowns in terms of helping to move teaching and learning online. And I think quite a few barriers that we for a long time thought would be very difficult to cross in the end were not that difficult to cross. And I think looking forward, a key challenge for us is going to be some of the access to content that we've gained, some flexibility for deploying systems and working patterns that helped us to weather the storm. How can we make sure that we don't lose them? after the pandemic comes to an end, whenever that will be. But certainly, I think at the moment, it looks like we have an environment of ongoing challenges, but not the lockdowns that were arguably a key driver for this innovation. So that was a key test, I think, for the whole piece of work. And it's taken us in some unexpected directions and arguably in some ways sort of really re-emphasized the importance of some physical elements of library service delivery. And in, I think, closing now, I want to highlight two of the many deliverables that already have come out of the working group. Um, and the first one is something that I'm particularly excited about is the digital workforce development strategy. I think this is a piece of work that's really been informed by this understanding that um, without a skilled workforce and a culture in which this workforce can really work actively and successfully, we are not going to really reap the benefits of the digital shift. Um, that was a crucial part of the work of this working group and has been taken forward uh, by one of the RLUK networks. And I'm really pleased that uh, we can now sort of see this published. And now no longer being on the group, but looking outside as a customer, if you will, I think I would encourage the group and others to really keep on the focus about helping libraries to master those challenges 
um, and help us to in an ongoing way develop our workforce because we don't know what some of the future challenges are but we know if we have uh, a workforce that feels empowered to make changes that have the skills and access to training and the organizational culture to take on challenges and be excited about that's a key part for our success and i think one way of supporting this that has been really very successful is the digital shift forum that's drawn participants from all over the world in several dozens of events that have already been run under sometimes really challenging circumstances when everyone was very busy and bringing in lots of different perspectives which we've all been able to capture and, and make available. And I hope that that will also continue to grow because it's critical to bring, I think, the library community together to share knowledge and information and to sort of help us support each other in some of these ongoing challenges. And for me, I think that's really the crucial thing that this work has achieved. It's created the forum at the space we can all support each other where we can learn from each other and i think that gives me a lot of hope um, that we're not just already looking back over best of catalog but that over the next years of the digital shift activity we'll see more and more exciting activities happen thank you very much I think you're muted. Yes, I'm just demonstrating that there's some digital skills I still need to, to, to pick up, particularly around Zoom. So thank you very, very much, Torsten. That was great and a really good sort of uh, kind of refresh of the sort of the foundations, both of, you know, the, the kind of genesis of uh, the digital shift, but also where we are, where we're going. Um, there, so there haven't been any questions sort of bubbling up at the moment, but I'm going to encourage people to keep thinking about questions and uh, and chat. Um, we, we have had some sort of thank yous to your good self, um, and hopefully you're, you're able to, to still join us for some of the rest of the, the session today, then that would be, uh, that would be fi fantastic. Um, with that in mind, then, I am going to go to the, the the next session, and we will move to the shift, uh, the shift to digital, bringing in um, Josh and Claire, and there you go, as if by as if by magic, Josh has set that up. So Josh is associate director for research at. Um, at the University of Nottingham, and he uh, and he's going to talk to us today about his manifesto for the digital shift. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you, William. And thanks to Torsten for that overview, which is very helpful. Um, and of course, RLUK positions the digital shift um, as a strategic strand, which cuts across all portfolios um, of our work as research libraries, um, as the nature of our work across collections, operations and audiences shifts from um, analog to a, a mixed analog digital environment. Reflecting back for me, I think its inception and its delivery two years ago was as much about rationalizing and articulating our experience as it was about declaring publicly our intentions for the next 10 years. And when it was launched, I was in a, a different role at a different institution, but now reconstituted head of open research at Lancaster University Library, um, where we've been guided by a digital first strategy for around a decade or so. And so when it landed, I recognised the drivers for change captured and conveyed by the Digital Shift Manifesto. Uh, and it's fair to say that it felt compelling and it felt familiar. And it still resonates today in my current role as Associate Director for Research at University of Nottingham Libraries, Manuscripts and, and Special Collections. Um, as my work, our work as a sector continues to position libraries as digital leaders, enabling the effective exploitation of technologies, um, pushing conceptual boundaries of what a library is and what a library does. 
And as a, a digital shift manifesto, um, as Torsten said, it is pervading, it permeates all areas of my work. Um, and as I go on, I'll discuss how it's aligned with my own experience over the last two years or so of working with exceptional colleagues at two institutions to exploit the digital shift. And I'll explore that through our services, our infrastructure, partnerships, and expertise, uh, which actualize aspects of, of the broad portfolios of open research and digital scholarship. So over the last two years, maximizing our digital shift capacity has necessitated purposefully developing the skill sets of our staff. We really shouldn't underestimate uh, the potential of our current staff to upskill. I know colleagues who hold and colleagues who have developed um, and applied specialist digital skills, but there's no doubt at all in my mind that as we move towards 2030, um, the wicked challenge that we must engage with is around attracting, recruiting and retaining staff with specialist digital skill sets, be they research software engineers, developers, learning technologists, um, AI specialists or indeed data scientists. Now, I believe that the, the call to action here is both clear and compelling. Um, and agree that responding to it will require collaborations right across the sector. And, you know, so I, I agree that the RLUK ADN digital workforce development strategy and related initiatives are, are really vitally important. I think over the last two years, we've also been making progress in the research, training and development space providing environments where communities of practice can form within our universities um, that bring researchers and members of professional services together uh, to build digital scholarship um, competencies and capacity. I'd highlight just a few wonderful examples of instances where we're building digital scholarship capacity within our universities. And the first spring, uh, the first thing rather that springs to my mind is our Summer of Data programme um, that one of my senior research librarians here at the University of Nottingham, Beth Montague Helen, is leading. So as part of this programme, Beth has convened sellout sessions, which have included Carpentries session. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the carpentries, they, they develop foundational and practical coding and data science skills through interactive um, workshops um, that enable attendees alongside the trainers to do things in practice, to take away those skill sets and apply them in their research. Now, Beth's focused on coding in R and research data management, but these approaches can build capacity right across the broad range of descriptors uh, here on the screen. In my own day-to-day -day work, I'm consulting on research grant development um, and, and looking really at projects that will enable and embed um, and translate digital scholarship within the arts and humanities. In all these activities, I, I guess we are really nurturing that mindset of, of digital curiosity and experiment, experimentation, really bringing the digital to life and making it accessible to our researcher community. And I think um, the wonderful thing is the extent to which skills development is, is really unlocking the latent potential of our collections, particularly when it's joined with digital infrastructure. Hopping back here just briefly to my time at Lancaster University Library uh, in this space, I'm reminded of the wonderful Lancaster instance of the Cambridge Digital Library platform, which shares and preserves unique and distinctive visual and multimedia collections, high resolution digital objects displayed alongside rich transcriptions of TEI markup. Now, I won't say too much more on this because I dare say that we're, we'll hear more about another instance of this platform and a consortial approach in today's session um, from Ian. But what I will say is that initiatives like this, they really do augment the analogue, enabling innovative forms of scholarship that really deepen and enrich our understanding of, of the arts and humanities of what it means to be human. 
What I will say about my experience over the last two years and our sectoral aspirations for the future is that to realise the digital potential of our collections, we really must continue to engage with complex copyright and licensing issues um, to ensure that we can, for example, leverage the, the power of text and data mining or enable the application of computational linguistic techniques that frame our collect collections as, as corporate. And I think this means interrogating our subscriptions, renewals and acquisitions and negotiating terms that allow us and our researchers to apply these techniques. And, and that means working with product vendors as well and challenging them to deliver solutions that empower researchers, for example, by developing graphical user interfaces that enable the novice user as well as the seasoned coder um, to do their work. Moving on to spaces, uh, spaces that enable library staff and professional services, um, researchers, students, and indeed the public to come together to develop digital scholarship practices that, that really open our collections to new possibilities. Um, spaces that are purposefully designed to blend the, the physical and the digital and seamless and interactive environments that act as Incudiscipline, the actors interdisciplinary incubators, excuse me while I stop falling over my words there, um, and the springboards really for follow on initiatives. And when I think about um, these spaces, I'm instantly taken back again to my time at Lancaster University Library and the 11 million pound capital project, uh, which included a dedicated events exhibition and collaborative um, space. Um, and this includes library research labs, which offer a flexible environment where the library will partner with its diverse researcher community to promote interdisciplinary um, open research and digital scholarship throughout the institution and beyond. I think it's important to say, though, that, that while the digital shift was at the core of our vision for these spaces at Lancaster University Library, um, which did deliver these wonderful unique spaces that you see on, on screen. You don't necessarily need significant capital investments to emulate the approach or deliver uh, similar opportunities. And I've no doubt that our colleagues at Lancaster will continue to provide our RLUK constituency with valuable insights by showcasing these spaces and sharing their approach during the years to come as a new member of our RLUK community. It's easy and perhaps understandable, I think, to tend towards looking at the digital shift through a technical lens, through conversations that focus on next generation digital research infrastructure, data repositories, research platforms, or full life cycle research environments, which enable those seamless workflows with interoperability baked in. Um, but I think, you know, really, the thing I would like us to do for just a moment is to is to zoom out almost and reflecting on my experience, the thing that I recognise is that the digital shift is really all about people. Um, as Torsten said, we can only achieve our ambitions by working with key stakeholders within our considerably sophisticated organisations, be they IT services, strategic planning and governance, procurement, or our research officers. Um, we need to, to work with these stakeholders to achieve our, our aims. And in this sense, the digital shift can only be driven um, by careful relationship management and advocacy. And those relationships are built on trust and credibility. And so over the last two years and as we move forwards, you know, I think it's really important that we develop that digital fluency um, and our own expertise um, and have confidence in our expertise and ability in the digital space as well. Um, you know, as library, knowledge and information professionals, our contributions in the digital space are significant and they are nuanced. Um, and as I prepared for this session, I reflected on the last two years and was reminded of our extensive role as service providers, partners and pioneers in the open research space. Uh, and a realization crystallized, and that is that we, we do bring extensive expertise, but we also bring equity. We double back 
and we focus on our values. We look to our university charters, statutes and ordinances, and we champion the use of digital to provide an augmented future where the free exchange of robust research improves humanity's prospects. As library and knowledge professionals, I would assert that we stand strong as one of history's original information technology providers. Since times immemorial, we've innovated, operating as a socio-technical nexus, the, the interface between repositories of knowledge and our people. The pace of change may have accelerated as our, our role has evolved, but I am confident that we will continue to thrive together in our digital shift as we move towards 2030. Thanks very much for joining me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Josh. That's incredibly inspiring. And I particularly liked the way in which you had uh, re reimagined our, uh, in, in a, a slightly uh, cooler fashion, the, the, the framework. So I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker in this session, uh, who is Claire Knowles, who is Associate Director for Research and Digital Futures at the uh, University of Leeds. And I'm going to hand over to Claire. Thanks very much, Claire. Thank you, William. Can you see my slides okay? Yes, you're looking good. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And thanks, Josh, um, for your talk. I was sat here nodding, going on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was great to hear and to see your slides. Um, so I'm speaking to you today about the library vision that we announced at the University of Leeds last autumn. And it very much correlates with the work that's been done in the digital shift. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we've got to our journey and through the vision over the last few years. So first of all, I want to share a, um, a quotation from Masood, our university librarian and keeper of the Butherton collection um, here at the University of Leeds, who was also the RIUK executive sponsor for the digital shift when it was launched two years ago. And at that time, he was at the University of Law. So the RIUK Digital Shift Manifesto and Digital Shift Forum have played a significant role in shaping our thinking for the future of libraries at Leeds. The discussions, insights and ideas brought to life by the RRUK community were fundamental to the way we defined our Digital Futures strategic programme. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that and it's a huge thanks to the community and everything that we've seen come through in the webinars, the manifesto, etc. that we can build on that and that's why it's a great community to work in, isn't it, the collaboration we see between our libraries. So a bit about the timeline. So we started work on our strategy, which has become our vision in 2019. So that's when the University of Leeds started its work on its strategy and we were following on from that. So we started right um, at the end of 2019 with work about what we were gonna do and consultation began in 2020 in January. And as you can see, I've put some stars at the bottom, which were key events. So that was, I think, 17th of March, I saw on the RIUK website when the Digital Shift Manifesto was published. And then you can see those sort of red triangles further on, which were key events for us in the UK with COVID hitting and lockdowns happening and what that meant for us all and our staff and our community with that acceleration that we had to do rapidly to digital, but also obviously what it's meant for us all getting through this, um, hopefully once in a lifetime um, experience of the pandemic. So in May of 2020, we shared th three library thought pieces, um, which were preparing for our strategy. So I think it's interesting if you look at the, the names of these and then see what comes on in our vision. And they were three thought pieces, one around collections, one around research and one around student experience. Um, so we've had a couple of other events um, happening. So we had our new um, VC, um, Simone Weitendijk, join us in September 2020. And there's a focus very much at Leeds on collaboration and global issues, et cetera, which you can see in the title of the university strategy, which is universal values and global change. So that was launched in February 2021. And in November of last year, 
we will launch Knowledge for All, the University of Leeds Library's vision for 2030. So that is taking us um, on to 2030. And at the moment, we are working on the forward plans, which we're going to release soon. And we split the vision into two forward plans, one to the end of 2025, and then we have another one to 2026 to 2030. So um, when you look at the university's strategy, you can see down in that bottom corner, digital transformation is a major part of the university strategy. So there's those five key elements um, under the strategy, and then there's an enabling strategy, which very much picks on the culture that we need, people, the ways that we work, the facilities, the equipment, what do we need to facilitate that? Sustainability, we have an aim for net zero at the University of Leeds for 2030, and our role in the city and the region in which we work and of which our staff live. So Knowledge for All has four key elements, one of which is digital future, the other one open higher education, then sustainable environments and enriched experiences. It's very much with our library vision that it cuts across the library. It doesn't relate to the structure and what team because these cut across all of our teams to a greater or lesser degree that we all need to be involved in the digital, opening up our education, be that our teaching materials and tutors, our research, which I'm heavily involved in, the sustainable environments, that's our digital environments, our built environments, what we put in those spaces, the use of them, and enriched experiences, the physical, the digital for people who are in Leeds, people who may never come to Leeds, people who um, interact with us remotely. And then there's the underpinning themes from that. And this very much um, comes back to what Josh was talking about, about the people. We cannot do any of this without the people. And that's where it is fostering a culture of innovation. You try stuff, it's can do, what can happen? How do we achieve these things without doing that? Sometimes small initiatives, sometimes bigger projects. Opportunities for all, enabling all of our staff to be involved in delivering the vision and those opportunities across the whole of the vision as well, and forming meaningful partnerships, be they partnerships within the library, within the university, within our local community, within consortiums like RI UK, um, N8 and White Rose that we're involved in as well, or international collaborations. We need those partnerships to enable us to achieve this and um, again, to bring together things across the, for the nation. So another thing that we've been doing at Leeds um, very much came out about the changes that we saw with those rapid changes that we made um, for COVID and to enable us to react really quickly to what we needed to do during the COVID situation. So last April, we started work looking at scenarios of what was going to happen in the next academic year. So we based this very much on two axes. What's going to happen with social distancing, because that really impacts our space and who could come through and the presence on campus. So this is the time when we were planning um, that we were very much still social distancing. So we looked at the four scenarios for this, but very much focused on the two in the middle that are highlighted in blue, because we would pretty much done social distancing and very limited access. That was the first lockdown and we've been paired for that. And that's what um, we were working with in that situation. And then scenario four, no social distancing and limited presence was a different thing altogether we didn't feel was likely that we'd need to plan for. But we did do planning around social distancing and hybrid teaching and no social distancing and hybrid, which is where we're at at the moment. You know, there's no social distancing in place, but it's very much still a hybrid environment for us with teaching and people's presence on campus and likely to continue like this going forward in some shape or form. So across the library services, we looked at the renovations delight, which I wrote, I picked up, I think, up from Michelle Blake at another one of these um, webinars about what would we like to keep that we've changed? What do we want to stop doing from pre-COVID or stop that we've added? You know, one of those things that we added, but we don't necessarily want to continue. What do we want to change that we've done it, but it wasn't quite right and we want to adjust that? And what are the things that we'd like to add? You know, we think, well, they're doing that. Let's, why don't we do some of that? And then we looked at considering that in three different areas. That's our people, staff, students, ourselves, and the public spaces, user spaces, office spaces, storage spaces as well, and the digital. So our systems, training, skills. 
And very much when you look at what came out of it, even the people in the spaces, a lot of it had digital elements to that as well. You know, if you're looking at, well, we still want to be able to continue to work from home, there's a digital element to that and um, ebooks, etc. And then we looked at adding the must, could, should, and weights um, with the Moscow. So these are some of the things that came out from those scenario plannings. Um, and it was very much things to keep and to add. And it picked up on the digital elements of this virtual events. We've all seen, and this is a great example, how we meet a much wider audience with having moved to these digital events. There's nothing quite like meeting people face to face, but the reach, the flexibility, being able to record and watch back later, it's been great to be able to do them like this. We've had issues with our inquiry system and that just came to the fore where more and more things were coming through because people couldn't necessarily ask face to face in COVID. Hybrid spaces, hybrid meetings all came across as well. The digital exhibitions, it's been great for us to be able to open our collections digitally. And we've seen that as well with the launch of our exhibitions. The Cottony Fairies exhibition launch that we had online got far many more people than we'd fit in the space in parks and court. Um, opportunities to engage with people through volunteering, etc., and consultations. So these are things that we came through COVID and we wish to keep. And then back to the vision. So as I said previously, that one of the elements of the library vision is the digital futures. And this way it picks up those different elements that we see in the digital shift skills, but not any skills for us for ourselves, but skills for our students, supporting them in the digital skills that they need for study and for the workplace going forward. Um, user focus, digital experience, and the digitalization of processes, very much like how, what do people want from when they go online? What makes it easy for them? What, how do they want to interact with our collections? Digital humanities and digital scholarships are picking that up and digital and information poverty and ethics, which again comes back to those skills. Our students come from many backgrounds and we need to make sure that we're providing opportunities for all of them. Um, digitization programme, this really came across during COVID um, access to materials for the arts, humanities and cultures faculty at the University of Leeds, ebooks, etc. And we're looking at how we digitize more make them available, what to want, how will they be used. Looking at our infrastructure, we desperately need to do that. And that's what we're looking at at the moment to make sure that it enables these other things to happen and connections to be made between collections. And then looking at um, records management and digital preservation. How do we preserve the born digital and digitized content? And then lastly, digital is also coming across in other areas of the library vision. It's not just that in the digital futures when we're looking at open educational resources and the White Rose University Press, there's the infrastructure behind that. How do we make things available in the way that people want to use items beyond the written word, including visualizations, images, 3D models, etc. The smart campus, and especially with our aims for net zero, how do we make sure we're making the best use of our spaces and they're adaptable, make it an entrepreneurial spaces. I'm very jealous of those pictures I saw, Josh. Sustainable storage, you know, we need to make sure that's for our digital, our physical, that we're getting things out when we need to reduce um, getting things where they're not necessarily. Um, our engagement programme is very much aimed to be physical and digital and hybrid going forward. And then the user experience for all of those physical and digital spaces. And as I said before, underpinned by um, people with the innovation, opportunities and meaningful partnerships. So in conclusion, it's very much that the digital is here, there, and everywhere throughout what we do. And we need to remember that. And the very much it's an underpinning environment to help us deliver what we want to do going forwards. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Claire. That's fantastic and incredibly exciting and ambitious. There's there's, there's quite a lot there. I don't think you're going to be short of. Of, of things to do. Um, so um, I'm going to open the floor as well if colleagues have questions for 
Josh and Claire in the next few minutes before we take a break. Um, we have a, one question. Unfortunately, it's actually for me, um, since I was I was reflecting, um, listening to, to both of your talks about uh, the, the, the sort of comments around sort of values and equity and various other things, which I think are kind of baked into the, you know, baked into the digital shift, but kind of Lisa from Aberdeen was asking, um, I kind of wondered about whether there's a culture wrapper around the sort of framework. And it's 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 great seeing Josh, seeing it sort of reimagined as well, helps you sort of think about it in a slightly different way. Um, and also the sort of comments around the sort of values and all the things that I think we, we we sort of take for take for granted. So Lisa, I'm actually not sure that I have many more thoughts on this just now, since it's really only just sort of percolated, but I think it is, um, and whether uh, wrapping it in a culture sort of wrapper is the right uh, is the right approach, and I would value Josh and Claire's thoughts on that, since it was some of your, uh, some of your work that kind of just really sort of triggered that, but I think it is, incredibly important that you know for all the focuses on digital shift as you you you've pointed out and as Masood had said uh, back at the launch you know this is holistic you know it is not just a you know it's it is an ongoing journey and it is also you know one that has you know it, it is very much grounded in some of our our values and our you know and our uh, kind of approaches to various things as institutions I've just some, yes, yeah, just some thoughts to contribute um, there, William. And I'd probably come back to, I think it's actually a misquote from Peter Drucker, you know, the, the line that culture eats strategy for, for breakfast. Um, but I do think it's fundamental to, to our, our, our endeavours in this, this space. And I often think about culture as, as, as the oil that lubricates the machinery of our, our great institutions of higher learning. And that's so much about how, how we create the environment and the ethos in which you have that, that digital curiosity mindset that growth mindset um so I, I really quite like the idea that there's a, a culture wrapper um you know that we can we can encase all of this within um that or it becoming in and of itself um a, a strand that's that's interwoven into what we do here so yes yeah, re really good points there something for us all to reflect on i don't know if claire's got any thoughts as well yeah, definitely agree. And we've been doing some UX training at the University of Leeds, and it's really interesting thinking of it, those small things that you can try and that you're not afraid to fail, because I think that's where often where people think, well, it's so big, and where do I start? And thinking about, well, what's the problem that my users are facing or I'm okay. facing, and how can I go about trying that? Because I think that's where it's building confidence as well. You know, I can try that, I can do that, this is it, and it is that innovative um, way of doing it and I think maybe breaking down sometimes what digital means that digital is not central IT you know and that's probably where sometimes people think well I'm not doing digital but I'm doing this and the other it's like no that is digital and I think that's where the carpentries are really helpful as well Josh going back to what you said it just show that some of that data manipulation data munging moving things between so it is digital as well it is, and I think I'm going to sort of take the Josh Sendo copyrighted phrase "digital curiosity" away today. I think that's that's something that um, I think is absolutely, you know, to, to to be encouraged, and I guess sort of plugs back into uh, into into that value. Um, Claire, you have a question from the the, the the chat, which is, can you say a little bit more about discussions and work around um, open education resources? Um. Yeah, so we've been doing work um, with the White Rose Libraries and there's a toolkit, I think, coming out, which is going to, I think, um, was announced at another meeting earlier this week. So, yeah, watch out for that. It's very much being done at White Rose level um, with our colleagues in York and Sheffield about OERs. And we also have um, an open educational champion at the University of Leeds that we work with. And it's very much looking about... What does that mean, OERs? What do we want? How are we going to share them, etc.? So I think we're very much starting on some of that and hopefully you'll see more coming from White Rose and from Leeds later. Okay, so if Thank you, you can, listen. 
yeah, if you can share and let, let us know around that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, Susie Cheek has asked a question for you both. How important do you think the technician commitment could be for supporting recruitment and nurturing talent, but also for positioning what the library can offer? So obviously the, the technician commitment is something that our UK has been sort of very involved with and very committed to. Um, I wonder if there's anything you guys could comment around that? Critical, I think, you know, yeah. so I, I was I was just going to say, I think I think that the work that RLUK, the AHRC and ARMA are doing in this space is, is really fundamentally important. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the, the outcomes from, from that work. Um, so very important is what I would say. Yeah, completely agree. I think it's critical and I think it's really useful for us in the conversations we have in our institutions as well. Um, I was talking to somebody going, do you know how our UK signed up for this? You know, how does this align what were you doing? And I think that's, it's really critical. Um, and I think it's, it's helpful for us and for those we work with. No, fantastic. And just in the background there, my RLUK mm -hmm. colleagues have just posted the RLUK link to the technician's commitment. So if anyone is sort of parsing, uh, parsing chat, you will find uh, a few links and various things to, to pick up from. So we are ready for heading into the second session of this afternoon and um, starting to, to look at that shift within digital. And I am delighted that we are joined, uh, first of all, by Ian Gifford, who's the Head of Digital Development at the University of Manchester. So I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Ian. Thank you, William. So let me just press the magic button. Your screen. Let's see what happens. Can everybody see that okay? Uh, okay, let me just, um, this is where I need to start the slideshow. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Okay, right. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as William said, I'm Ian Gifford, head of the digital development team within our research and digital horizons uh, directorate at the University of Manchester Library. And I'm going to uh, give a brief overview of some of the things that we've been doing um, in relation to our ongoing digital transformation. Um, obviously, I can only cover a, a few things in the time, so I'm going to try and focus on some of the major changes and developments from the last two years that we hope will um, help us to mature as digital practitioners, innovators and service developers. So if I can squeeze it all in, um, similarly to Claire, I'm going to briefly cover our strategic vision and how digital is firmly embedded within it. And I'm going to talk a bit about some of the structural changes that have been made in support of this. And I'll share a few practical examples of digital innovation at the library, um, reflect on some lessons from recent uh, collaborations we've been involved in, and end with a quick reference to some other related work and, and some future plans that we have. So I joined the library in 2010, and as with many other libraries, the you know, digital transformation has always been happening. Um, we've already undergone two major digital programs between 2013 and 2019, one called our library and one called Digital First. We've also had ongoing attempts at introducing some form of agile working with varying degrees of success um, in fact, to try and facilitate this, we became early adopters for the university's Office 365 and Teams rollout program and actually got access on the 2nd of March 2020, exactly three weeks before the national lockdown, which I have to say made a huge difference um, to our ability to respond to the pandemic in the early stages. In 2019, um, Chris Pressler joined Manchester as university librarian. And as you've seen, you know, we had a good track record with digital programmes, but we'd never really set our sights further ahead in the next two years. And Chris immediately set about working on establishing a long term vision for the library, which got interrupted by the pandemic. Um, but it was finally published in January 2021 and it's called um, Imagine 2030. So it has strong links to the university's strategy and builds nicely on our previous kind of work um, for the previous decade in digital innovation. It has three strategic programmes focusing on our local, national and international presence. And each programme has an explicit digital element, although similarly to the Leeds vision, it's clearly recognised that digital is fundamental to the success of the entire programme. 
So each program has a number of lead priority areas. Uh, the first program is called UOM Global and it has Manchester Digital Collections as a priority area. The second program um, is called National Research Library in the North and has Digital Scholarship as a priority. And the final um, program based at the local level is called Our Library and it has what's called a Digital Library Manchester as a priority area. And I'll do a little unpacking of those three digital areas. So the first priority area is called uh, Manchester Digital Collections, which as well as being a reference to a range of collections and activities, um, is also the name of a specific system. And Joss has alluded to this already. The system was the subject of a case study actually for the new review of academic librarianship, which I think may have already been linked here, um, as it became a major priority for us um, during the pandemic. So MDC, as we shorten it to, is a high quality IIIF image viewer with curated content containing rich TDI metadata, and it's based on Cambridge Library Digital Viewer. Um, it was launched in January 2020 with nine collections, and about a month into the lockdown, when the dust settled, we realised, um, initially to our surprise, that it was possible for us to actually keep developing it remotely. And we made a decision to double down with quite an aggressive content loading schedule, and have managed to increase the number of collections to 35 within two years, which far exceeded our original expectations. Um, we've also developed a number of technical innovations in the system, including a dynamic and interactive home page and a number of back end tools um, to support curatorial staff working on images and content. In addition to this, in May 2021, we launched the first exhibition in a new Manchester Digital Exhibitions platform, which is based on Amica S. And we're currently working on developing a university wide service where academics can choose between a more limited self service model based on a standard template or a bespoke service working with library developers for more customized content and features. Now, both of these systems are key contributors to our second priority area, which is a digital scholarship. So we have been contributing um, to digital scholarship in many different ways for a number of years, but never really in a clearly coordinated fashion and with little or no strategic direction. So we've just undergone a major academic consultation about the library's contributions to digital scholarship. And we formed a project board, um, including representatives from um, academic and research, um, an operations group, and uh, we're in the middle of drafting a vision statement and a roadmap, sorry, jumped ahead, uh, for the next few years, so we can provide a unified view of all the library does, consolidated service catalogue, and a clear direction of travel for the future. The final priority area is, is well, it's basically still to be defined. So we've turned to Digital Library Manchester and we're holding an internal visioning workshop in a few weeks. And it could actually encompass an, any number of things um, as this slide attempts to, to show. Um, a critical part of it from my point of view, as well as my colleagues and digital services team is, is having a clear strategy in place around infrastructure and managing growth and how we can adequately develop and support future services to meet the goals of this vision. But um, I definitely that's not, not um, all it will contain and there'll be a number of aspects to it. But, um, early stages for that one. So in order to ensure the library is in a position to effectively implement this vision, uh, during 2021, we had a major restructuring exercise affecting the whole library called digital, called library reshaping, which included the creation of new digital leadership positions, um, including Lorraine Beard, um, who I'm standing in for today, uh, who's the head of our directorate, um, including my role as, as head of digital development, also my colleague, Kieran Talbot, who's head of digital services, and Bill Eyre, who's the research data management strategic lead. And it included a number of changes and um, key changes within the digital teams themselves. So within our digital services team, these changes included creating clear routes for development and progression, uh, bringing library systems and support teams closer together and enabling more empowerment and devolved decision-making at lower levels of management. In the digital development team, um, two senior developer roles were created, um, increasing the total number of our developers. Um, it again enabled clear progression routes for technical staff. Um, in, in addition to this, the library's web and digital communication developers who were previously in the comms and marketing team moved into the development team, which among other things has enabled us to work more closely and collaboratively on website development and innovations. So speaking of innovations, I'm gonna move on to a few practical examples of, of things that we've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, firstly, live dashboards have long been an interest of mine ever since I was a library developer. And just prior to the lockdown, he had developed an in-house um, digital dashboard 
um, on a physical screen, displaying occupancy data alongside live physical checkout information, breaking things down by faculty, and we used a bit of AI to show things like common duples and triples. But as soon as the lockdown occurred, it became redundant and we had to pull the plug. So very shortly after the lockdown, we ran a, an experiment to see if we could reuse some of the dig digital elements of the dashboard and turn it into a digital only dashboard. And we managed to do this up to a point because um, we only have access to a couple of sources for live e-resource usage. But we did manage to link it to live information from a number of other systems or services, such as our digital collection system, our library form system, and one or two others as well. We did it fairly rapidly, uh, but it served an important purpose in the early stages of the lockdown, um, when many of people assumed that um, because the physical library was closed, that was it, that the whole library was closed and nothing was going on. So this was a really nice way for us to visually demonstrate that we were still very much open for business and there were still lots of things happening. Secondly, uh, we did a lot of soul searching during the lockdown about our digital interfaces, thinking about the experience of remote users when this was the only way they could access services. Um, one thing we questioned was, why do we generally treat our websites as one-way message boards, always presenting information in a static hierarchical fashion, when that's not really what the web was designed to be? And we've decided to experiment a bit with, um, with this um, on the web presence for our newly launched Office for Open Research in April this year when instead of just defaulting to our usual way of presenting things, we've actually stored web content in a graph database with the intention of making display content more dynamic and relevant. So all the articles are tagged and we can dynamically pull out things like latest and trending content and allow users to explore tagged and related content in a way which wasn't really easy when we defaulted to our standard CMS approach. And it's still early days with this, but we're hoping to do some more interesting things with it over time. Finally, one of our biggest successes over the last two years is the adoption of robotic process automation or RPA within the library's development team as an effective tool for automating repetitive data centric ta tasks, which is what RPA is particularly good at. Working closely with our ITS automation team, we've been able to utilize our university's central UiPath, UiPath platform, UiPath being, being the kind of the vendor um, platform which supports um, scalable RPA. Um, while allowing us to develop and support our own robots. So here's some examples of processes that we've automated, um, some of which have actually had a really big impact on both the teams and the services they support. So to pick one out, our previous process for transferring student data to core text for our e-textbooks programme was highly problematic. It could take days to make changes to course module information, which resulted in poor user experience. But now it's extremely efficient and we've had a drastically reduced number of access issues. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about two major collaborations that we've been involved in over the past few years, which have, have had a big impact on us. Um, so following our initial project with Cambridge to adopt their image viewer platform, they have now launched an open source consortium for the underlying platform and technology. And we are working very closely alongside both Cambridge and Lancaster University um, to move to a collaborative development model, um, as well as developing a shared vision and set of values for the ongoing development of the platform. Alongside that, we've been involved in a major international development project with Harvard and Stanford universities, turning Stanford University's email archiving and appraisal tool EPAD into a full-blown email preservation system, which we're co-project managing with Harvard, um, as well as providing the development resource. So aside from any software or service deliverables, these projects have had a big impact on us. Um, as before these projects, we've not really been involved in many large-scale collaborative development projects. And in the past, we've often been quite reticent to get involved in, in large scale projects and preferring quite often to do things ourselves and say, you know, have that control over those projects. So although there have been and continues to be many challenges uh, in working closely with other large institutions, in addition to the benefits of shared resources, shared responsibility and support, et cetera, there have been massive benefits in observing, interacting with, and learning from other team cultures and approaches firsthand, which have been a real revelation to us. Um, and it's actually kind of changed our mindset, I think, in terms of the way that we approach large development projects. And we're beginning to think much, much more and more about actively looking for development partners from the outset. And so we're kind of thinking now we're, um, of a few examples where we can actually do this with some research development projects that we have on the go at the moment. 
There are, of course, a, a lot of other things going on. Um, each of these areas could be a presentation topic on their own. There's lots happening with research data management. We have some major library spaces projects um, in the pipeline. Uh, hybrid working is obviously something that's affected everybody, you know, in a very powerful way, which um, we've been working a lot with. There's also been some quite interesting work taking place in Manchester around um, cyber response, which was flagged as one of the major risks for us. And I've been doing some work on behalf of the library to understand our readiness, really, to deal, to deal with um, a cyber attack, such as doing guided exercises with external consultants and reviewing the mitigations that we have in place if that happens. And finally, um, just in terms of future plans, uh, work is continuing on all the priority areas I've mentioned. Um, um, we're continuing to, to realise the benefits of the reshaping project. Uh, we want to do a lot more with RPA if we can, and we're planning to run a chatbot pilot over the next year. And we'd like to try and identify a few more practical use cases for AI in the library. We found it a few, but that's not been as straightforward as we first thought. Um, we want to continue with our experiments with web, and particularly in relation to our special collections and how they're accessed and, and displayed over the website. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll be looking to continue and extend our collaborations. And there's a, a particular software platform that we've been working on called the Open Access Compliance Platform. And we're currently actively seeking people that might want to partner with us on that particular project. So that is everything um, I was going to cover. Um, I'm going to hand, stop sharing if I can find the button. <laughs> Fantastic, Ian. Well, you you guys have clearly been busy over the last couple of years. So there's some there's some really exciting initiatives and some real kind of breadth of uh, of work there. So uh, fantastic. So um, I will actively encourage uh, colleagues if they I, I I may have a question or two for you, but I'm I'm going to I'm going to wait till we we do uh, uh, do that uh, and we'll wait till the end of, of this session. Um, so I'm going to introduce our second speaker in this session, um, Susan Halfpenny, who is Head of Research and Information Learning Services from sunny Aberdeen, although I believe, Susan, you may be referring to some work from another institution as part of your presentation. Yes, very much so. I am joining you from Aberdeen at the moment, but I'm going to be reflecting on the work that I undertook when I was working at the University of York. So I'll just get my slides up now um, and hopefully I can work uh, technology, seeing as I'm going to be talking to you about digital skills. Uh, so hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, yeah, looking good. Yeah. Great. So what I'm going to talk about now is sort of the work that we undertook at the University of York in terms of developing a programme of staff digital skills initiatives. So at this point, I do want to give a big shout out to the people on the call who are from York and in particular, Ariel Redman, who I believe is on the call, who was instrumental in working with me on this project since she joined the University of York in 2019. Hopefully I got that right, Ariel. <laughs> So uh, this is going to be a whistle stop tour of basically uh, the last six years of developing a digital skills program. So some of this work is before the publication of the digital shift, shift manifesto, but much of it aligns and is informed by that because during this time I did work closely with Masood, who um, was obviously leading in the digital shift area for RL UK. There was also Michelle Blake, who was working on this project at York, and Sarah Thompson as well, who was working on this project as one of the senior managers at York and involved in the digital shift work as well. OK, I think I've dropped all the names I was going to at the beginning. I'll get into the uh, presentation now. So, as I mentioned, this is going to be a whistle stop tour of uh, sort of six years worth of work. Uh, so we first started looking at the development of digital skills at York back in 2016. So what kicked all this off was um, the make or break uh, report, which was published by a select committee from the House of Lords who were looking at digital skills and the digital economy. They were really exploring the exponential um, development of digital technologies and what that impact will be on the workforce. And this report really indicated that need to develop digital skills. So it showed that 
56% of the workforce needed the digital skills of a digital maker, so being able to code and do complex digital tasks, or digital workers, so being able to configure digital systems. 95% um, of the workforce would need basic digital skills as well. And there's a lot of concern at the time about us not having uh, those capabilities within the workforce and there being a digital skills deficit, which I'm sure you've come across in this time as well and been working on your own strategies towards addressing. So in response to this at York, we decided we'd launch a programme of staff digital skills projects. Our initial aim was, was to develop this scalable and sustainable digital literacy programme. We were ambitious in our approach of wanting it to meet the varying needs of all our stakeholders. So it wasn't just for library staff at this stage, it was right from the offset for all staff at the university. Uh, and we really wanted this to ensure that we got the best return on the technology that we had. So it was about raising awareness, baseline capabilities, surfacing the information, we, you know, services we had, and really about launching a blended uh, learning program. So our first stage to doing this was to map what we already were doing and to identify the key projects. So we already had uh, some digital skills training that we were delivering on, and we'd already started to explore a number of projects which intersected with digital skills. As a result of this, we did formulate three key projects that we were going to work on in the initial phases. So uh, the key one was information services. So this was working with our own staff to build digital capability. We also wanted to look at digital leadership and partner with organisational organizational development and people at the University of York, where we had leadership programmes in place. So we wanted to embed digital skills within those programmes. And we also had another strand that we were looking at at the time, which is training pathways, which was a project which was going to develop uh, the materials that we needed to in response to the needs from the various groups we were engaging with. So really at the first stages of the project, it was a lot of learning. Uh, we didn't just launch all these programs straight away. We really needed to understand what our stakeholders need, holders needed in terms of digital skills and what support we already had, uh, what support we would need to develop. So we spent a lot of time looking at existing digital capabilities frameworks. Our initial objective wasn't to develop our own framework, it was to work with what we got there. So we were looking at the GISC model, which was established in 2015. And a bit later on, we were looking at the, um, the Department of Education model for digital skills, which came out a little bit uh, later on, as I say, 2018 for that. As a result of this, we were kind of working with a like, 95 digital capabilities that we were trying to run like sort of um get an understanding of confidence on get an understanding of what uh, resources we had to that and you know like running focus groups across all these skills so it was quite granular the work that we were doing at this stage and this resulted in lots of audits and uh, here I've got a graph up from one of our audits which was mapping skills to ex existing training that we were doing. We did spend a lot of time doing this and if I can offer some advice here, don't go as granular when you're looking at auditing digital skills because it did take us a lot of time. We did get a lot of data from that but in terms of the usable data, by the time you'd sort of written reports and collated it, people had developed their digital skills, things had moved on. So that was certainly the beginning part in terms of that intelligence gathering. We were going a bit too much of a deep dive. Although the focus groups that we ran and process mapping as part of this intelligence gathering, I did find a really useful exercise in that early stage. And, and as part of those um, focus groups, one of the things which was really key that came out of that with some of these attitudinal or psychological barriers that people have with engaging with digital skills. So people saying, oh, it's not my job, or people saying like they already know there was a lot of overconfidence when actually abilities weren't really there to evidence that, or underconfidence or being scared of saying that you're failing because you're talking to your manager in these focus groups. So we knew what ever in 
um, interventions we put into place, we need to be mindful of this attitude of, oh, I can't, or I can always already do this, or the time constraints. So it's really helpful to gather that rich feedback from the focus groups. Another thing that came out in these early stages as well was a uh, baseline digital skills. So this was back in sort of uh, 2017, 18 that we were launching this, but we were, it was really clear at the early stages of this project that we needed to address really basic uh, digital capabilities. One of the things that came up time and time again in the focus groups, particularly with IT colleagues, was people don't know what a browser is. So before we could really start to build on digital capability and get into some of the aspirational goals of our project, we knew that we need to develop a guide, and I've got that up on the screen now, of the IT Essentials Guide, which would enable us to point to that and really give people that starting point before we moved into any of the more complex tasks. So that really brings me on to when we started once we gathered all that intelligence, started to get an understanding of our stakeholder groups, we really started to develop some resources in response to developing staff digital skills. So first thing that we did was we formulated our approach, which was very much based on the focus group work and our understanding of digital skills and what we wanted to achieve. So what we wanted to do was map our new programme into these three foundational areas for developing digital skills. So we had IT essentials, which I've talked about those baseline skills. We had working practices, which we really wanted to contextualize in the type of technologies and the infrastructure that we had at York, what the systems were. We're a bit atypical in terms of higher education in the fact that we were using Google uh, rather than Microsoft products. So there was some of that that we needed to consider when we were de developing training and um, skills frameworks. And the final part of that framework was really thinking about digital transformation. Some of this was informed by this SAMA model that I've got on the other side of the screen, which came from our IT colleagues who are really interested in how we move from uh, tran translation using digital tools to digital transformation. As part of this process, we did develop our own skills framework. I mentioned that we were working with the GISC one and the government basic digital skills framework, but we were working at such a granular level when we had like 93 capabilities to 134, I think we had at one point, one of my colleagues who joined the project Friday, Chidlow said, this is just unworkable. We can't have all these capabilities that we're mapping to. So we developed our own digital skills framework for working practices at York. It was split into these six key core areas in terms of IT essentials, innovation, ethics, um, collaboration, information literacy, and um, communication. And then within those six areas, we just had uh, 24 skills. So a much more reasonable and manageable amount of skills to map to. We also developed a digital skills diagnostic based on this framework that people could start to assess their confidence uh, within these various areas. We did introduce some additional training and support. We already had some training sessions and we've been very much focused on uh, bespoke training for various departments, but we decided it would be useful to launch some generic training sessions that all staff would come along to. So we put these into the three key, key areas that we had for our framework and we've got them there. So in terms of uh, some introductory workshops to Google, some bite-sized training sessions for staff over a lunchtime, uh, and through to developing again app script course so people could look at how they could automate processes. We had the program which was looking at digital leadership, as I mentioned, and as part of this, we were able to embed digital skills into their leadership, existing leadership programs. And we also worked with uh, people and organizational development to embed digital skills in some other uh, endeavors they were working on. And probably our key achievement at this stage was getting uh, digital skills um, acknowledged in all professional services staff uh, performance uh, development reviews, which are done on an annual basis. 
by this stage, uh, in the summer of 2019, we had got senior backing for this uh, project as well. So the VC was talking about this and supported our digital skills framework. And also the chief operating officer uh, was talking about digital culture at this stage. We then moved into the final stage of this project, which I'll just quickly whip through in terms of looking at digital culture. So it wasn't the end of our digital skills journey. I feel like it was just another beginning, beginning for us to work through this. So obviously changing context at this time, we all know there was a global pandemic. This really changed our working practices. It meant we had to digitize processes. It meant our workforce really needed to develop digital skills. It felt again like we were going back to 2015 with some of the reports that were coming out in terms of the skills deficit. We hadn't cracked it. We still need to work needed to work on the development of both basic and advanced digital skills for our workforce and ensure that there was real engagement with any training we were putting on. So we did see an increase in training at this time and we saw an increased engagement with the training we were offering at York, but it still didn't reach all the workforce uh, from the reports that were coming out then. It's about 40% that weren't that, that new initiatives were reaching in terms of digital skills development. So we still had some way to go. At York then, we did have some developments that we were working on, and I suppose these will be similar to what you're experiencing at your own institutions with hybrid working, new change programmes that you might have, or new organisational structures as part of this. Throughout these new projects though, from the library and information services, we really did start to engage with the conversation in terms of any success of a digital transformation project is reliant on people. It became our mantra at most project meetings that we went to, you've got to think about the people, you've got to think about the skills development as part of anything that you're using with digital technologies. So that's, this brought us to a new vision for staff digital skills at York, uh, which was really looking at a culture of digital curiosity, making the perceived impossible possible. And I really promise I didn't edit that slide, Josh. It was up there before. I think it's minds working in that sort of di digital shift and digital mindset that we are, that it really becomes comes down to that culture. So we started looking at sort of developing digital fluency and having a digital mindset to enable that resilience and keep pace with uh, demands of a fast changing environment. We wanted to really emphasize in the new objectives, the new ways of work, working in digital transformation and digital leaders were still key for this next phase of the project. Uh, so our next chapter at York, but also as I was leaving York, I will say we'd started to formulate some digital first principles for embedding this digital culture. We start to look at the development of a core set of digital tools to really help build advanced capability and use of that core set rather than having sort of a disparate collection of technologies that we we're using. And we started to think about how we could um, engage with members of our community to be digital advocates, champions and coaches. So a more devolved uh, IT support model. And with that, I will put up the slide with acknowledgements. There were lots of people who've worked on this project and hand over for questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Susan. And clearly great minds thinking alike. I don't know that both you and Josh could have uh, bookended the you know the, the, the two sessions around digital curiosity within the digital uh, within the digital shift uh, any better. So opening the floor, we've got a couple of minutes before we lead into the the last session. Um, we will need to finish absolutely just before four pm. But um, opening the floor for Susan and Ian. So uh, I'm, well, I'm just going to sort of shamelessly say, Susan, yeah, I think a lot of that, certainly at the, the level of York, resonates with the, the wider work that we want to look at around the digital skills um, framework. And it's interesting that you comment that some of it feels as if, you know, looking at those reports from 2020, 2021, that perhaps, you know, sort of nationally or kind of more broadly, there's not really been as much progress. 
Um, so, which is which is really interesting. But it looks as if, you know, certainly from the baseline and the programming and things that you've done, then that clearly, you know, York has made a has made a big impact. Uh, I think across the piece. Yeah, it's quite interesting with the report. Sometimes I look at it and I feel, oh, it's depressing. But I think in terms of the baseline capabilities, we have improved and. Depend, depending which report you read, I mean, if you read the Lloyd's Consumer Index, we made like five years worth of progress in terms of those basic digital skills in that time. So we are seeing, as you say, the, there is some wins in there. Um, so I, I hope it didn't come across too negatively. <laughs> no, I, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that it was. It was. I think it was. I think it was sort of pragmatic and indeed actually sort of underscores as Thorsten was was kind of commenting and as I'll, I'll say in, just briefly in the next piece although I may not need to that you know it reinforces how important the you know the work that we're spinning up around the digital skills framework and the digital you know the, the digital workforce strategy uh, actually is not just from sort of that baseline but through to you know particularly thinking about the the work you know some of that reshaping work Ian that you've been doing at uh, sort of at Manchester as well, and really sort of harnessing quite a lot of, of those sort of, sort of, kind of, you say, higher level kind of skills, you know, sort of a much more kind of specialist digital skills in obviously then rethinking, you know, some of the work with the, you know, with the website or moving things forward with CDL and so on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is, as has been mentioned before, that recruitment is hard, <laughs> you know, to, Get those race specialists and i think we've been quite lucky and you know we've had some people in the team that have come over from I its and have brought some of those more kind of advanced skills and knowledge of, of how to kind of do some more you know interesting things within the website but it's, it's similarly with the ai as well um you can talk to people about it but actually um and you can kind of buy stuff off the shelf with ai solutions baked into it but how how it's to be used in a, in a kind of a more practical way where you can adapt it to special use cases um, it's quite difficult I think to get those kind of quite um, advanced skills in place with, the, with enough understanding of library um, circumstances and use cases and, and the actual skills you need to adapt it as well um, so we're yeah we're still kind of working our way through it really yeah, no, uh, I can absolutely empathize yeah, empathize with that um, one question that um, I was just going to go into the mix, Ian. So I was really interested in the sort of that that collaboration piece that you're doing. So is that is that something you're finding? I, I guess on the one hand quite scary, but on the other hand incredibly <laughs> valuable. As you know, obviously you've you know you've been doing work with kind of Lancaster. You know, as, as yeah. CDL has become more open source. But even again, the work with kind of I've, I've jotted down EPAD and Stanford and email for digital preservation. So I think that's been really interesting to see as well. Yeah, it, yeah it's been a huge learning exercise for us. And we, the funny thing with those um, partnerships, we didn't necessarily set out looking to do them. I mean, the, the digital collections one, which was um, driven by a very enthusiastic academic who kind of hated our existing image view for early on. So it was something we got involved in um, necessity. And with EPAD, we, we were kind of adapting the software um, which got Stanford's attention and we were sort of invited in. But it, just the, the huge benefits that we've had from, from just engaging with them, in a, you know, on a kind of week by week basis and, and, you know, comparing our own approach with theirs, it's really made us realise that, you know, even though there are, you know, it's challenging sometimes, um, it's kind of made us kind of hungry to do more collaborations, really. I think we were a bit, our mindset was very more reticent and stuff. We were quite lucky having a big development team. We could do a lot of stuff on our own. But we've not, not really experienced the, the sort of power, I guess, of, of kind of those really intense collaborations. And it's kind of, it has changed the way we, we, we look at things. And, and we're really keen to kind of be a bit more proactive now, I think, in terms of future collaborations. Um, and there's a lot more than just the benefit that you get from this particular software. It really is about those developing those relationships, which, you know, are long lasting sometimes and can lead to other things in the future. So it's been a really yeah, beneficial experience. We talk a lot about collaboration, but it's, having the experience of it is a different, is another thing. 
Uh, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you both. We've only got a few minutes left, so we're going to lead into the, the last uh, the last slide. But can I ask all of our collective audience to just give you that virtual, hope you can feel the virtual glow of applause and thanks. Um, we've had sort of various comments and so on as well. So thank you both very, very much for that. I think there's a lot to sort of pick up and take from, take from there. And we're just going to move into the final uh, final session where we've only got a few minutes. So I'm just going to give um, a flavor of an update of some of the work that we're doing around the, the, the digital the digital shift working group um, ourselves and uh, give colleagues an opportunity for any sort of last questions that they may have. In the last couple of minutes, then uh, I just wanted to highlight so as Thorsten had commented, the Digital Shift Working Group, I'm not going to read um, all the, the names um, here, but obviously we're delighted that some of our members, um, Susan and Claire, were able to, to join us today. The Digital Shift Working Group is drawn from across all of our UK's uh, networks, and it has been incredibly satisfying to work with all of these colleagues because it does cut across all of the work of all of the networks and embed itself across um, all of the strategies. As Thorsten had identified, uh, had commented, these were some of the five areas in the short term. So some of that included the, the highlights such as the, the COVID-19 report, the, uh, the article in the new review, uh, a lot of the engagement with HRC, stakeholder mapping and so on. So there's been a lot of really good foundational work uh, which has been done, led by uh, Thorsten uh, during his time at the group. And I really just wanted to finish with the, the two areas that we're really building on going forward. There's engage and, and build. And engage is around, uh, one of the key pieces of that is going to be looking at doing some baseline of where individual institutions are as part of the digital shift and some of their kind of IT, some of their resilience, their engagement around the various different dimensions. Um, and around build, that really leans into what Susan had commented around um, the, the, the sort of digital skills, but having that scaled up collectively across Research Libraries UK, and that's through the Digital Workforce Strategy, which is going to be coordinated through the Associate Directors Network, but again, will cut across all of the all of the RO UK networks and will tie in to uh, the, the strategy and some of the broader work which we are doing.